Welcome everyone. We're so pleased to have you join us. My name is Chiquita Paula de Souza, and I'm the, one of the education chairs on the American Academy of Pediatrics section on Global Health Executive Committee. This AAP Global COVID series was developed in response to the unique issues COVID has had on our personal lives, our partnerships, and our global health communities. The AAP and AAP section on Global Health are happy to bring you today's webinar, the eighth in the series, in partnership with Atlas International. Please note that the opinions expressed by our panelists reflect their personal experiences and do not necessarily re represent AAP policy. We'd like you to save the date for the next in the series, when border crossings are not possible, how to keep pediatric professionals engaged in global health, which will be on September 28th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. This year, for the first time, AAP will host our NCE virtually from October 2nd until the 5th. Uh, early bird rate ends today, which is September 18th, so, or this week, so please uh, register if you are interested to get that um, discounted rate. Um, and then we'll move on to a few housekeeping issues before I turn it over to today's moderator, Nick, Dr. Nikki Sinclair, who is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin, and she's also a Section on Global Health Executive Committee member. So we will be offering 1.5 CME credits and one MOC Part 2 credit for live participation in today's webinar. This is just a statement on privacy and confidentiality. And then I'd like to mention that um, all conflicts of interest were renewed and resolved as seen on these slides. Please check your email for instructions on how to claim credit. Um, and then um, here's a little bit of information on how to get your certificate. I also want you to use the Q&A box to submit questions, not the chat, so that way we don't miss any questions. Questions will be addressed after all panelists have concluded their presentations. And if you are tweeting, please use the hashtag AAP Global COVID Series. Thank you very much to the AAP for the opportunity for us to do this webinar. Data suggests that approximately one in four pediatric residents participate in a global health elective at some point in their training highlighting an impressive pipeline of globally-minded trainees. Educators and trainees are now scrambling to figure out how to keep their training globally relevant and avoid the vision that many of us have fallen victim to during the pandemic. This is just a snapshot of the many pediatric global health tracks that have been created across the U.S., supporting global health training both stateside and internationally. The field of global health education has evolved remarkably over the past decade. And in 2018, the American Board of Pediatrics Global Health Task Force, in collaboration with leadership from the Section on Global Health, the Association of Pediatric Program Directors Global Health Learning Community, and other stakeholders at the Global Health Education, comprehensive practical resources for incorporating global health education into pediatric training programs. In this guide, authors propose five core pillars of global health education, stateside curriculum, pre-departure preparation, global health electives, post-return debriefing, and evaluation with partnerships as a core component of sustained training exchanges. The COVID-19 pandemic but understand halt to the majority of global health training opportunities, including significant modifications to even stateside training opportunities, which were forced to pivot to virtual platforms. Educators have since engaged in many strategic discussions about how to navigate these rapid transitions and how to safely consider future global training experiences. The objectives for this webinar are to identify innovative resources and strategies for receiving and delivering global health education during the pandemic, recognize potential barriers to virtual collaborations with global partners during the pandemic, and brainstorm potential mutually beneficial opportunities, and consider criteria that will be necessary for reopening global health electives in the future. To prepare for this webinar, we recruited a panel of experts in global health education and provided a question for each of them to address. We are incredibly grateful for the time and expertise that they put into preparing for this webinar, and I will introduce each prior to their respectable section. Notably, this is a re-recording of our prior live webinar due to previous technical glitches, and unfortunately, Dr. Alaput Alaput was unable to join us for the re-recording. 
Dr. Umphrey will represent that section of, of, of their, that portion of their collaborative section. First, we will start with the treatment perspective. Dr. Zach Tab is the current AAP Section on Pediatric Training Liaison to the Section on Global Health. He is a senior pediatric resident at Baylor College of Medicine. He served in the Peace Corps in Uganda, is a former Fogarty Global Health Fellow, a former editorial fellow for the AMA, Journal of Ethics, and the former executive leader on the Training Advisory Committee of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. Dr. Tab is passionate about global child health equity, health systems engineering, and medical education and ethics. Today, Dr. Tab will help us to understand some of the questions, frustrations, concerns, and ideas that have been shared by global health trainees during the pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Tab. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak today, um, share a little bit about my experience as a trainee, but other experiences um, from other trainees that I've, I've heard about across the country. Um, it's certainly uh, a unique time to be a trainee, uh, which I think goes without saying. So there's some uh, big questions and concerns, but also opportunities that I think are coming along uh, during this time as well. So what's it like to be a global health trainee in 2020? Well, we are doing our best. I think there's been so many um, abrupt changes that have happened that at times feels like the rug has been pulled out uh, from underneath us. Uh, you know, in the beginning, it might have seemed like um, there wouldn't be so many restrictions or wouldn't be as widespread, but certainly uh, it didn't take long to see that as the pandemic was unfolding and countries were closing borders, that this would mean major uh, changes for us as, as trainees. Um, and so with those major changes, I think uh, there's, of course, appropriately uh, major questions. You know, how long will this all last? Uh, at least how long will the uh, pandemic uh, um, be as widespread to maintain all the restrictions that we've, we've had in place with travel, with communication? A lot of projects have been, um, um, in best case scenario, postponed, but in many cases canceled. And so um, when we're looking to make future plans, what benchmarks can we look for as trainees to try and um, re-engage uh, in those commitments we had or, or, or global health experiences that um, we were looking forward to in our programs. Um, and so I think we look to our programs, we look to what's happening in the world, um, and we try and um, filter out uh, what's the signal and, and what's the noise. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, as being, um, um, global health trainees and, and those who work in the field of global health, of course, uh, requires flexibility, but that doesn't mean it's frustration free. So um, you might have come to a program looking forward to the global health opportunities, or you might be looking ahead during this application season for programs and their global health opportunities. But um, now with all the changes, uh, where does that leave you? And I think, um, the experiences for each training is going to be different. It's going to depend on what your prior uh, level of um, global health experience is, as well as your level of training. You know, if you've never had any uh, global health training and you were looking to uh, to start uh, and explore um, that as a as a career option uh, or work that into your future career, um, you'll have one set of uh, questions and challenges and and um, versus another uh, level of experience where you've had a, a greater deal of uh, travel or projects um, and weighing the uh, the impact of all the changes and certainly for medical students it'll have a different set of challenges than uh, a resident and different set of challenges than uh, if you were a fellow um, and part of that will have to do with the flexibility uh, the program you're in or the program you're going to uh, schedule-wise, um, and there's oftentimes very little flexibility, um, and so that is a common concern um, that, I, that I've personally uh, heard about and, and experienced myself. Um, so there's both impact in the short term and then the long term 
as well. And I know for, for me personally, it sometimes feels like there is a, a war on two fronts. You know, one, uh, dealing with the pandemic and all the changes um, um, and seeing the effects to uh, child and maternal health um, that have resulted from the pandemic, but then also looking um, out and seeing uh, the U.S.'s withdrawal from so many uh, previously uh, robust uh, international partnerships and collaborations and really withdrawing from the, the world stage um, from organizations such as the WHO or just uh, threats to global health uh, funding in general um, and um, wanting to double down your engagement uh, more than ever at a time when uh, there's more restrictions than ever. So what's there to worry about? So I um, already alluded to some of this, um, but uh, as trainees and training programs with their own clinical and educational and, and scholastic responsibilities, um, that means that there's often limited scheduling um, to participate in uh, global health opportunities. And so if they're postponed or they're canceled entirely, um, have I missed my shot to do those uh, experiences? And again, some of this will uh, be influenced by your level of uh, prior experience, but also your training level, and whether you can finagle some rearrangement of your program um, or your schedule with your program um, to try and get uh, more experiences or to replace it with something else that might not um, be the original plan, but um, some compromise in between. And then, uh, you know, as training and training programs, looking around to your training program um, to seeing how they're uh, pivoting during this new working environment. Um, what um, um, changes have they made or are forced to deal with um, because of travel or, or closing of country borders, um, cancellation of their own activities and partnerships? I certainly don't envy um, many program managers and, and, and um, those in medical education, global health education right now, because um, they certainly have their own host of uh, challenges and uh, questions. And then much of the focus so far has been professionally, but um, you know, oftentimes in this work, you develop personal relationships uh, from those afar, either um, at different uh, training programs here through collaborations or um, internationally with, with partners from experiences or projects. Um, or other initiatives that you might undertake and uh, collaborate with other people. And so uh, maintaining those existing relationships, for me, I know is, is, is important uh, personally, but um, for many others as well, um, wanting to maintain that sense of community that is so um, um, part of being a global health uh, practitioner and global health trainee. So uh, part of that then, of course, is staying involved from afar, Often there's, uh, or, uh, there's been a huge, of course, selective pressure on uh, webinars and telecommunication, like this one you're watching now, um, which I think is one of the great um, silver linings of all the changes that have uh, taken place. Um, but the access to uh, that technology, of course, is not evenly distributed across the world, so there's their own challenges there. Um, but um, I think, um, those are uh, questions that we're all uh, feeling right now. And then, as I kind of mentioned earlier with the war, talking about the war, I'm feeling like the war on two fronts, um, the knock-on effects of healthcare. And there's been a number of um, um, criticisms that have been discussed about the COVIDization of the healthcare agenda and what impact that's gonna have on uh, child and maternal health um, and um, the threats to decades of gains that have been made uh, in those areas um, as already uh, limited and stretched healthcare budgets are redirected uh, entirely to um, fight uh, uh, COVID. Um, but uh, just as we are uh, flexible people, I think we're also uh, optimists. And so when one door closes, I think there's a lot of opportunities that can emerge from that. Um, and I, I feel that, you know, there's never really been a more universally shared uh, phenomenon as this pandemic, um, and so I think there can be um, a great sense of uh, community built up around that, 
Uh, and my own unbiased opinion is that uh, trainees are a great resource um, to utilize during this time. And I think there can be a great um, reflection on our uh, the focus of our work and our international partnerships, uh, looking to reestablish um, philosophies of uh, partnerships based on uh, equity and reciprocity. And so that involves connecting with our international partners during this time and understanding what their felt needs are and their uh, goals are moving forward and uh, coming together to, to address those. And so, um, as, I, as I had uh, already mentioned, I think connecting virtually um, is going to be one of the great uh, long-lasting silver linings uh, of this the, with the selective pressure on uh, telecommunication and, and um, whether it's conferences, whether it's webinars like this. Um, for myself personally, I've never uh, heard from so many non-Western voices as I have in the last several months during this pandemic as these platforms have expanded and reached uh, higher uh, populations that haven't had the opportunities uh, felt in the same way to uh, speak out and be heard and to uh, express their concerns and questions and, and their um, strategies for dealing with all the changes. So I think that's a great um, change that will, will last through uh, all of these restrictions um, as they are lifted over time. And uh, of course, uh, you know, making it fun as well. I, I've mentioned it a couple of times now, building a sense of community, um, having a sense of reciprocity. And uh, one thing that uh, our own program has done to um, have a shared experience or, or bond during this time when we're all um, socially distant um, is to have viewing parties. So we watched a documentary on tuberculosis and an organization um, seeking to raise awareness for tuberculosis tuberculosis, but to make it a little lighter, we um, made uh, tuberculosis-themed drinks. So one person made an orange-colored uh, drink as a, as a nod to the side effects of rifampin. So um, it doesn't all have to be uh, serious and academic. You know, you can be, um, we can work towards building a sense of community and strengthening a sense of community during this time. Um, and I think a great opportunity with the virtual connecting is to, is to do that with our own program and our, or other trainings in our country, but also internationally as well. So there's been great resources that have come out uh, during this time, I think through CUGH and BPI. Um, I use uh, Twitter a lot, which helps uh, me connect with writers and thinkers in this area, but also other webinars and conferences um, that otherwise I would never have had access to, which are now moving online. Um, to uh, expand their reach. So I think, again, there, there's been a lot of uh, changes and um, cancellations and restrictions, but um, in other ways, there's uh, been an emergence of new connectivity, which I think will be uh, beneficial. So um, again, I, I thank you for the opportunity to speak today, um, and I look forward to hearing from the other speakers. Thank you, Zach. Dr. Carmen Cobb received her MBA at the Medical College of Georgia and completed Combined Internal Medicine Pediatrics Residency and Chief Residency at the Medical College of Wisconsin, then served as hospitalist and co-director of the Pediatric Residency Global Health Track at the Medical College of Wisconsin. She is currently an Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco, as hospitalist and co-leader of a medical student internship preparation course. Her clinical and research interests include global health, LG, LGBTQ health, medical education, and curriculum development. She has offered to highlight resources that are available for educators and trainees to optimize global health training while remaining at their home institution. Thank you, Dr. Cobb. Thank you. My section will focus on resources available to both educators and trainees to enhance their global education while remaining stateside. Many of us are now required to learn in place with the travel restrictions and safety concerns already mentioned. In my role as educator, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced me to tap into creativity, find new resources, and frankly, use my global health training for medical school and residency to find flexibility and new avenues forward. I'd like to give you an overview of some of the resources I and colleagues have used extensively in stateside education 
and in global health elective preparation prior to the COVID-19 pandemic so that you can have ideas of where to turn when deciding on curricula that may work for you or your learners. I will also discuss making the tools available in these curricula accessible by using virtual simulations to engage trainees as much as possible given current limitations. I will also touch on some ideas of writing or adapting curricula that you may already have in place at your institutions to modify into virtual sessions and address a few thoughts on continuing safe and collaborative stateside partnerships in light of the need for adaptable and safe engagement in our current time. Some of you may be familiar with the SUGAR suite of curricula and the resources available therein. SUGAR stands for Simulation Use in Global Away Rotations. It is a simulation that now contains several different highly adaptable sets of curricula that lend themselves well to virtual and self-taught learning. SUGAR itself is the first and foundational curriculum in the series and is made up of multiple scenario-based simulations. It's meant to challenge learners' biases and emotions when caring for patients in a different setting than their usual practice surroundings. You can find SUGAR at sugarprep.org. They are extremely user-friendly for the facilitator. They have brief scenario overviews, the instructions and supplies needed to run the simulation, and tips to debrief the scenario. Very few supplies are needed to allow for quick setup and launch these scenarios with learners. Sugar Pearls, Procedural Education for Adaptation in Resource Limited Settings, focuses on common procedures and adaptation for different resource settings. This includes, for example, how to build a bubble CPAP machine with minimal supplies. The Sugar Pearls will require more materials to run and it is an excellent opportunity for global health trainees to have hands-on experience with materials that can be used in acute patient care situations anywhere in the world for common procedural modifications. SPAC Pre-Departure Activities Curricular Kit, as its name implies, aims to prepare global health trainees for electives abroad. It is a comprehensive preparation curriculum meant to be done prior to departure. And topics include assessing personal motivations, travel, health and safety, wellness, culture shock, and preparedness. SPAC covers these 10 domains and utilizes resources from SUGAR, SUGAR Pearls, and the ABT Program Director's Guide to Global Health Education. Together, they form a comprehensive resource for global health education and preparation and give the educator the framework and tools to use when implementing these curricula. The newest member of the Sugar Suite is titled IPAT, Immigrant Partnership and Advocacy Curricular Kit. As many trainees and educators in global health are passionate about and embedded in partnerships with immigrant organizations throughout our community, the same team that develops the sugar material have developed IPAC this year, meant to bring learners a comprehensive view of how to best care for immigrants in our community, bringing the global health mindset home as people from all over the world are our neighbors. You can see the modules and brief descriptions here, including overview of the immigration process, clinical concerns, social and emotional health, ethics, medical legal considerations, community health assessment, partnership building, and advocacy in action. With a tool belt full of such curricula, educators can tap into their inner creativity to make continued global health education a reality for their trainings. One modality I have had success with here at UCSF is in adapting simulations to become virtual. This does require buy-in on behalf of the learners to engage over a video conferencing system, and it does require careful prompts on behalf of the facilitator to ensure a simulation environment rather than a didactic case. However, I have found that multiple sugar simulations lend themselves very well to virtual simulations and have received feedback from learners that these simulations enable them to interact and flex their global health muscles in a way they have been craving to do over the last couple months. There may be also other simulations available specifically created to be done virtually, and some of them are tabletop simulations or case-based. In these, learners and educators may be more comfortable and familiar and use breakout groups and role play over teleconference. Some institutions, such as UCSF, have adapted simulations they would generally do in person, such as mock codes or internship training, to the virtual environment. Again, this does take creativity, and in some cases may uh, require sending a box of supplies to each trainee to make the optimal learning environment possible given current limitations, but it is possible to accomplish. 
With regard to adapting what may already be in place at your institution, think about what is already there that may serve your trainees who can no longer go abroad at this time. If they still have time in their schedule for their global health electives, how can you best help them to meet their educational goals? Is there a way for them to connect with families with global roots and understand their experience of immigration and integration? Can you use existing curricula to form an advocacy elective for your trainees? If you feel there is work to be done modifying or writing curricula in your institution, some places, such as my colleagues at the Medical College of Wisconsin, were able to redeploy trainees that were pulled from their global health electives in March of this year to learn in place by creating a global medical education elective with trainees gaining experience in creating curricula either to be used stateside, virtually, or internationally. Lastly, I would like to encourage us all to continue to evaluate our partnerships and work to address our partners' needs in a safe and non-burdensome way. This is a picture of myself and several trainees and community members at a community refugee education center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Over the past three years, trainees have developed a relationship with the center and the refugees and brought mock medical visits and monthly health education and Q&A sessions to refugees at the center. Instead of discontinuing these during the pandemic, they shifted the sessions to online, which enabled the trainees to connect with the refugees they built relationships with and enabled our partner, the International Learning Program, to meet their goals of improving computer literacy and medical literacy among the refugees. UCSF has also adapted technology to continue to engage our partners. And our monthly asylum clinic has shifted from in-person to history and psychological interviews over secure video conferencing allowing for enhanced access and safety during our current time. I'd like to leave you with a list of a few resources, most of which I have discussed, but a few more for your review at another time, such as other online modules that you may use and a descriptive manuscript on the creation of this test. Here is my email. Please do not hesitate to contact me if any questions or ideas arise, or if you would like to discuss and collaborate further on virtual adaptations be creative ways to make learning in place engaging and productive for our training. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Dr. Michelle Nishirenko is a pediatric emergency medicine physician and director of the Global Health Program at Boston Children's Hospital. She has experience in pediatric care, quality improvement, and program development in China, the Stuchu, Guatemala, Liberia, Laos, Indonesia, Iraq, Lebanon, Palestine, Uganda, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Syria. In Liberia, she provided pediatric humanitarian aid in the immediate post-conflict setting and has continued collaborations for the past 10 years, including leading the Liberian hospital public health response during the 2014 Ebola outbreak. She has conducted hospital system quality assessments in Lebanon, humanitarian health response capacity assessments for the WHO, and consults for the World Bank African Centers of Excellence program. Her particular areas of interest are in the provision of healthcare in humanitarian settings through system development, the development of emergency care systems for children, as well as the role of children in humanitarian crises. Given her extensive experience with global partners, we asked Dr. Nishirenko to offer some reality check viewpoints for trainees and educators to consider prior to seeking collaborative training opportunities with global partners during the pandemic. Next slide. Perfect. Um, thanks, Nikki. I'm really happy to be with you guys today and to share this perspective. Um, you know, I think we're all longing for the days when we could get on a plane to be with our partners in person and the rich experience and environment that provided us. Um, you know, this uh, is an image from partners working on the Ebola outbreak uh, using the U.S. Humanitarian Air Service. And, you know, the ability to be physically together is something that I know six months in, many of us are really longing for. And I think that, you know, motivates us and our trainees to want to get back to the field. And I think it's something that requires a, a bit of thought about how we, how we do that, but then also how we collaborate remotely in this time period. And so, you know, we're really thinking about, you know, when we work with our partners about bi-directionality and true partnership where we're with them as I'm on the left, um, visiting one of the labs in Burkina Faso, really talking about some of the infrastructure and planning, or it's having our partners come to us. These are two of our colleagues from Lao who came to do uh, clinical rotations with us in specialty areas. And our ethical roles in being 
good collaborators, bi-directional partners, and avoiding some of the power dynamics in neocolonialistic and other hierarchical issues that can really affect our work and our relationships. I think these issues become much more challenging remotely, and then thinking about how we work around them and address them with our trainees and resuming global health remotely, I think poses us some really interesting challenges. You know, it's very hard if you haven't been to this remote village in Liberia to know what it's like to live here, what are the constraints of everyday life, the familiarity of the culture. And so bringing a trainee onto a project who may not have ever been to that environment or have the ability to understand it can be quite challenging um, to then work with the partner. And so really thinking about what their familiarity, familiarity is with the setting recognizing that one setting like this rural village is very different than this crowded refugee camp that's more like a you know an urban tightly packed city and the culture of this region versus in the Middle East versus an African region you know bringing our trains into that environment and the extra uh, effort it will require from us to brief them and bring them up to date on what we know about the culture is a limitation of them not experiencing it firsthand it's also very hard for them to build relationships. Um, you know, it's, uh, this is lunch at a hospital that I worked at. Um, I know at least for me, it's hard to eat a giant bowl of soup quickly. And so it really forces you to, um, you know, take the time and you sit with your colleagues over lunch and learn about their families and their villages and their towns and upcoming holidays and the weather and all the things that really impact the way that you interact with colleagues locally. And, you know, having virtual soup um, is not something I've seen done yet, um, maybe it's possible, um, but it's sort of this lost opportunity of building relationships that I think becomes very hard to do and, and even maintain remotely. And so bringing our trainees up to speed on sort of what it's like for our, uh, our partners in this personal relationship can be a little bit more challenging if they don't already have a relationship. There's also the culture of the hospital. And so, as we all know as health providers, you know, every hospital, every clinic has its own kind of culture, its own feeling of the staff, how they interact with their environment, how they flow through the environment, what spaces they perform, what clinical duties in. It really drives a lot of the clinical care in their practice. And so, you know, even thinking about working remotely with a partner for educational activities, joint education, journal clubs, or even process improvement, or trying to think about remote projects, you know, not having a familiar um, engagement with the culture of the actual medical facility could really limit our trainees or sort of lead to solutions that may not be practical or take up time from our partners. I think it's important to really think about the hospital culture. Um, similarly, there's charting and data. Um, and so thinking about what's feasible to collect from a chart. You know, if people are not already documenting it, adding documentation can feel like a very Herculean lift. And so designing a research study or, a, you know, a remote project to do with a partner would be very hard if you're not already familiar with the charting system. And then, you know, it's sort of additional layer of thinking about can you support a partner with remote data entry, recognizing that people on the ground are really busy caring for their patients and data entry is kind of the last thing they have time with. I think that's a great opportunity. Um, it can also be a way to really offload work from our, our local partners. I think the challenge becomes, you know, data sharing is a very intimate relationship and the trust that's involved in that, if you don't already have it, I think would be quite difficult to build from a distance. And so how and when to make that request to share data or to exchange in this way um, may pose a challenge depending on the partnership. We also think about teaching, you know, we're doing a lot of remote teaching, engagement with our colleagues. It does lose some of the hands-on pieces. You know, we obviously as an emergency medicine physician, we do a lot of procedural and hands-on teaching and how to work with people to apply care at the bedside. And, and so when we did resuscitation training, you know, I think the most rich part was, you know, one of our, our team members then being just in the hospital and around to help the doctors and nurses work with them at the bedside, apply what they learned. And it's really kind of lost in our remote teaching efforts right now. I also think that our partners are quite busy. Um, many of them are dealing with COVID at a similar kind of smolder or places are on the rise, depending on where our partners are located. And so in all honesty, they're, they're just busy with COVID. You know, COVID has divided the manpower, has reduced their serviceability, affects their clinical systems. 
maintaining their safety as a constant stressor, just like it is for us. Um, these are my colleagues in Liberia who learned uh, from their Ebola response work and within three weeks of COVID had opened a COVID care unit uh, in this dedicated facility. And so it divided the staff in the hospital because some people had to go and run the COVID facility and then everybody else had to cover in the main hospital, which then you know really kind of taxes the workforce even more. And so the bandwidth for people to even interact with us for remote education is getting more and more, can become more and more limited. And so sort of recognizing they're under some of the same stressors we're under um, and may not actually have time for us. And so I think this is a really interesting time in global health and a time for us to listen and be humble and hear what our partners are asking for, whether they ask for it directly or indirectly, um, and really sort of acknowledging what their needs are, even remotely. Um, recognizing, too, that our U.S. response has not been world class, and so there are some countries and some programs that um, really don't view the U.S.'s COVID response very positively, and so recognize that COVID-related topics may be off limits to us um, working with our partners, even though we as individuals and our institutions may have had successful responses. And so one of our partners uh, in HIV public health education we really had to stick to our HIV mandate um, because the government was very skeptical of anything related to COVID from the United States. And so it's really important to think about that ramification of as we approach partners and what it may mean for their trust um, in us just coming from the United States. Hopefully some of our existing personal relationships will you know, supersede that or mitigate it. But I think it's very important to recognize that their colleagues may be more critical um, or their administration may be more critical than they may have been in the past. And so I think we have a lot to offer still remotely, a lot of opportunity to maintain our collaboration, but then also um, an interesting time to really adapt how we think about things and the way we can actually work. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to the moderator. Thank you, Michelle. Next, we will feature perspectives from Drs. Peter Alaput and Lisa Umphrey, who have had a long-standing global health education collaboration. Dr. Alaput Alaput previously joined us on her live webinar, but unfortunately was not available for this re-recording. He is from Mbali Regional Referral Hospital in Uganda, where he works as a clinician, a senior lecturer, and a senior research fellow with the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership. His research is in the areas of clinical and infectious diseases epidemiology, pathophysiology, and disease treatment outcomes. He has won grants with NIH, EDCTP, MRC, and Wellcome Trust, and has published 93 peer-reviewed works. He is a fellow of the Uganda National Academy of Sciences and a member of the Uganda Medical Association. Dr. Humphrey is a U.S.-trained pediatrician and a current Global Health Fellow at the Center for Global Health, Colorado School of Public Health. After completing her residency, she moved to rural Uganda and worked with various small nonprofits to provide pediatric care and build pediatric capacity in the region. In 2013, she created Atlas International Incorporated, a U.S.-based NGO to support global health partnerships between her Ugandan and U.S. colleagues. In 2014, she joined Médecins Sans Frontières and completed several field missions before taking a headquarters position with MSF France as a pediatric advisor. She has now moved her family back to the U.S. to bring her international health interests closer to home. We asked Drs. Alaput, Alaput and Umphrey to collaboratively offer some suggestions for mutually beneficial remote collaborations during the pandemic, particularly for partnerships that were previously involved in the exchange of trainees. Thank you, Dr. Umphrey, for representing both of you today. Thanks, Nikki. Next slide, please. So as Nikki said, I'll be speaking on behalf of both sides of our partnership today. Um, turning first to the side of the partnership in Uganda, Mbali Clinical Research Institute, which we call MICRI on site, is a platform for clinical care, research, and training. And it's based in Uganda in the east. I'll show you a map in just a second. But it's, it's one entity made up of three smaller entities. The Research Institute itself is one. The second entity is Busutema University, which is a health sciences center um, for various trainees and for various levels of medical trainees in the region. And then Mbali Regional Referral Hospital, which is the main clinical site. Next slide. So here's a slide of where Mbali is. Um, for those of you who may be familiar with Uganda, 
Kampala is the capital and Tebe is where the main airport is. And a lot of the main clinics and hospitals that are sort of famous for international collaborations are based there. There was very little previously in the east of the country. So the little splotch of color there is where Mbali is located, right on the border with Uganda and Kenya. And the focus of education and research and support in that part of the country has been really a boon to increase pediatric care in the region. Next slide. Just briefly, MICRI was sort of informally in existence a long time ago, around 2008, but it grew into a full legal institution in 2016. And it's recognized internationally as well as within Uganda and has a lot of different bodies of support. And the leadership is Professor Alpha Alipat. He's the executive director and one of the key founders. And then he works with a very talented board of directors and they have an ever-growing management team. It's a big operation. Next slide. The five pillars of MICRI are listed here. Infrastructure, research, capacity building, staffing, and networking. And just a quick word about each. So as I said previously, there wasn't really a huge center for academic pediatrics or research or laboratory work or what have you in the east of Uganda. It all was more clustered around the capital and down in the southwest. And what Dr. Alpa Alipa and his colleagues were able to do was make a medical school, you know, make very impressive laboratory uh, facilities, make a library, just add to the infrastructure in the region to support the, the necessary academic initiatives. The second pillar, research. Um, MICRI has become really a powerhouse in the region and internationally for various research projects. They've published multiple times in the New England Journal of Medicine. They've been involved in some really landmark studies, such as the FEAST trial back in 2011. Um, and they have become a very well-respected uh, and very powerful research entity. The third pillar is capacity building. Uh, the center is based around trying to train up medical specialists and junior researchers in the region. And then moving on to staffing, McCree has been very successful at not only training up a new generation of medical professionals, but then recruiting and retaining those people to stay in Mbali. It's been very impressive to see uh, the different sort of medical specialties flourish as a result of what McCree has been able to do. And then the last pillar is networking. Over the years, MICRI has developed incredibly strong networks throughout East Africa, uh, throughout universities in the US on its own, through places in Europe, and it really has become a center for a lot of interesting work. Next slide. This is just a quick summary of some of the funding relationships, training and research relationships, and then patient care relationships around MICRI. Um, and you can see in the middle is our logo, Atlas International. So this is just to say that we are one of several very important collaborations for MICRI. Next slide. So switching over to the U.S. side of the partnership, Atlas, as Nikki said, is a U.S.-based nonprofit, which was established by me in 2013, and I still am serving as the CEO. And just like MICRI, I am working with a very talented board of directors. We've picked up past volunteers and very kind souls along the years. And what we do is two main things. We partner with existing organizations in Uganda. So there isn't an Atlas clinic or an Atlas hospital. We exist solely to support the work of our partners that's already happening in country. The second thing that we do is that we connect U.S. organizations with our Ugandan partners. Next slide. Little history about our partnership. Um, we informally, informally partnered in 2009-ish, 2010, um, and then we were able to formally sign a memorandum of understanding in 2013. And just a quick point here as a recommendation for those of you listening who may be involved in different sorts of part excuse me, partnerships, having formal formal agreement, not necessarily a legal one, but a formal agreement like a memorandum of understanding is incredibly important and one that can bring a lot of benefits. You can put on paper exactly what each of you are going to bring to the partnership. You can set time limits. So, for example, us, for our partnership, we reevaluate our memorandum of understanding every three years. We have it reviewed by our board of directors, and we very clearly state what we each are going to bring to the partnership. And it's just a nice communication tool to make sure we're on the same page and that we continue to stay on the same page. 
the main three things that we bring to the partnership, I would say, are number one, we can serve as a bridge between faculty at universities in the US or in Uganda, and we can also serve as a bridge between institutional projects and programs. We can vet and we can match interested medical trainees who want to go to Mbale and do an international elective. And although the final decision about who can come and when they can come and what projects they may do rests with MICRI, we are the people who can go through the applications for interested trainees. We can make sure that all of the pre, -pre, -pre preparation is done. And by the time a learner gets to Mbale, MICRI knows that they have been vetted and they're ready to go. And then the last point that we bring to the partnership is that once people have been approved to go to Mbali, we can coordinate and support their visits. And we do that for about 10 to 20 visitors per year. And we do that for medical students, for residents, for fellows, and for faculty. Next slide. So a couple of the successes, just to mention briefly about our partnership. We have been able to connect many U.S. institutions with MICRI over the years, which has been exciting. We can provide programmatic support. So as Mikri says, hey, we want to work on X, Y, Z, we can turn to our networks and figure out ways that we can help that. We can gather donations and supplies for our partners. And uh, over the year, usually we'll stay in touch with our partners, see what they need, what they don't have access to in Uganda. We can look for those items or even purchase those items from within our networks. And we can send those things with our volunteers to Uganda. We have been able to collaboratively generate a lot of exciting projects uh, and ideas for research. And then one of our main successes is that we've been able to fundraise for making fundraise for our partners. Our partners may not necessarily be able to provide a tax exempt receipt, for example, or um, a, a framework online to collect donations, but we can do that. So for anyone who comes and works with Atlas or who wants to go to Mbale for a rotation, we ask them to give an administrative fee, a clinical fee, and they need to raise funds. And all of that goes to our partners. None of it stays with us. And then the last thing we can do, we can do focused fundraising. So recently after COVID hit, we were able to do a very short online fundraiser to help support some initiatives that MICRI had planned, but ultimately weren't able to fund because of COVID. Next slide. So COVID hit. <laughs> And like most people, we had a lot of challenges come up. Um, we actually had five trainees on site when COVID kind of really was ramping up and uh, the U.S. at least was getting nervous. So uh, those five trainees from two different programs were pulled out quite suddenly um, for very good reasons, but for better or worse, they were pulled out quickly without a lot of discussion about them being pulled out. And that was a big challenge. A lot of rotations that we had planned for the rest of 2020 and 2021 have been canceled or are on standby. And at the moment, although we have a few people kind of out in the ether waiting to see if they'll be able to travel, there's no confirmed in-person visits. So it's a bit up in the air. And, and since so much of the funding support that we're able to provide to our partners comes through the long term, most of the is a big challenge for how we're going to um, yeah, still access those funds and respect our obligations. And as you can imagine, there's a ton of uncertainty about the future. Next slide. So as happened elsewhere in the global health world, we started to ask ourselves a lot about virtual global health. So in what ways could virtual activities replace the activities that were already happening at MICRI? So for the student lectures, for faculty meetings, could any of that be replaced with virtual activities? Likewise, could virtual activities replace any of the usual global health activities that we had planned? Um, we did notice that some groups either had already or were quickly launching or adapting uh, virtual activities for their partnerships. And a good example of this was Child and Family Health International, as you can see from the little photo on the slide. Ultimately, what we found though was that there was very little guidance in the literature about what to do about how to shift partnerships virtually, about what could work in a global health sphere. And also what I saw was lots of brainstorming from many different institutions. What could we possibly do? How can we address all these challenges that have come up because of COVID? Next slide. So we ultimately decided to launch a project to address some of these questions. And 
what began as a question that I posed to myself and to Peter, what in the world were we going to do with our Atlas volunteers who were confirmed for the 2020 to 2021 season, grew quickly to a question that I posed to some of the groups I'm affiliated with, specifically the Midwest Consortium for Global Health Educators. I asked that group, what are all of you doing at your institutions? Have you found any solutions? Have you discussed any um, potential ways forward with your partners? And there was a lot of, mm, we're not really sure, we're also interested, but we're not quite sure what direction we're going in. So I proposed to lead a project jointly with a focal point from MICRI um, to see if we could address this question in a more formal way. And very quickly, as we started asking around what other groups are doing, what other projects are in the works, we were able to put together a study group of people who wanted to work on this with me. And right now, that study group not formally represents, but includes members from MICRI, from the Colorado School for Public Health, from the Midwest Consortium, from the APPD, from Child and Family Health International, Baylor, and a few others. And we ultimately decided to launch a survey project that we hoped would generate some guidance on what we should do in the coming months and years. And our lovely acronym is on the left. Not very nice to say, but hopefully very clear for what it means. Next slide. So the aim of our project is to survey members of Global Health Partnerships on their capacities, preferences, and opinions on collaborative uh, virtual global health partnership initiatives during the pandemic. Next slide. And the objectives that we laid out. So first, we want to just describe the characteristics of current global health partnerships among the respondents. We want to see if we can determine preferred engagement strategies during the pandemic. If any exist, we want to see if we can identify geographic differences in the preferences to see if there's any big difference between what the high-income country partners say versus the low- and middle-income country partners. We want to determine the perceived barriers and attitude, attitudes between, excuse me, attitudes towards the uh, engagement strategies. And then the last thing is we want to try to determine factors associated with the acceptability of the preferred engagement strategies. Next slide. So as we were planning and as we were going along, we realized pretty quickly that we needed to be clear on what we meant by a global health partnership. And if some of you are familiar, you may have read this in the literature, but global health is a bit of a nebulous term, and there's been some papers that have tried to very clearly define it, but global health can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people, and global health partnership is no exception. So because we had such an interesting study group um, made up of people from different groups and from different countries, it became clear that we needed to be very, very clear on what we meant. Next slide. So for the purposes of this study, we decided that we would define global health partnerships as any trans or multinational and or domestic collaborative health partnership that bridges geographical distance and or resource levels to promote the health and well-being of people anywhere in the world. And we wanted to be sure that anyone who was involved in any sort of partnership could complete the survey. So that could be clinical research, public health, whatever it may be. The only requirement would be that the partnership has a mutual focus to advance health. And then we also wanted to specify that the partnership could represent two different organizations or it could represent a headquarters site with a more international site, for example, but within the same organization. Next slide. So the methods for our project, we created a cross-sectional anonymous online survey and hot off the press, we received our final, final um, ethical review board approval from Uganda. So this is going to be going live next week. The inclusion criteria are that anyone who's a global health partnership leader or focal point can participate. So at least for the moment, we're not looking at trainees to get their opinions on how the partnership is affecting their learning. Um, it's really just going to be um, opinions on the from the people who are guiding the partnership and making the decisions. Exclusion criteria, unfortunately, we won't be able to include people from the European economic area. There were some extra ethical review considerations. Um, would we have done that? And we decided we didn't want to delay the survey launch. So we hope to include them in future iterations of the project, but not for this one. And then we set up to have all of our statistical 
um, expertise come from MICRI. So we have a data manager and we have a statistician who is in charge of our database. And then we were able to translate all of our survey materials into English, Spanish, and French. Next slide. This is just a quick graphic that Professor Alipa Alipa had created to just show that um, the Virtual Global Health Partnership Initiative can be sort of a conduit between jointly planned activities and the continuation of global health programs. Um, and this ultimately is what we're going to try to show with the survey that there is a potential path that could meet all the needs of both partners. Next slide. The anticipated outcomes for our project so we are hoping that the data we can generate could guide the planning for virtual global health partnership initiatives through the pandemic. Um, and we are planning to share preliminary reports as soon as we have them available. So yes, we may you know, present this or try to write up a paper later, but we want anyone who participates in the survey to have access to some of the insights that we get as quickly as possible. We also hope that we can address the potential for the fulfillment of academic requirements um, that are still going to be lingering in the coming months to years. We hope that we can encourage a dialogue between partners. So although the survey is for one person and it's anonymous and it's online, we hope that the questions may stimulate a little bit of discussion. And likewise, we hope that some of the questions may also get partners to think about, oh, maybe that was something that wasn't working super well in our partnership, or maybe that's something we can address in the future. We are very excited that these virtual initiatives may open the door to new bidirectionality that didn't previously exist in partnerships. And I think the survey will shed some light on what could and couldn't work to promote bidirectionality. We are also hoping that our project will, at the same time that we're completing it, show an example of how you can engage virtually. All of our study group is from all over the world and none of us have been able to meet in person and we're pulling on resources from various institutions. So we hope to sort of walk the walk while we're actually making, res uh, making recommendations. And then last, we hope that this survey can start laying the groundwork for future best practice discussions since there was such little information in the literature. Next slide. So just to sum up, um, in our decade or so long partnership that has been recently challenged by um, all of these sort of hiccups and speed bumps from COVID, we decided we wanted to make just the following recommendations to anybody involved in a partnership. And the first point is that more than ever, we have to keep communication strong. And in some ways it's easier than ever to communicate and to meet virtually. You know, I didn't know what Zoom was a few months ago and now everybody knows what it is. So there are things out there that can facilitate our communication, but at the same time, on either side of partnerships, we're challenged more than ever before. Um, so more than ever, it's important to keep in touch with our partners, make sure we're on the same page and make sure that we're each bringing as much as we possibly can to those partnerships. It's a great time to ask questions and clarify expectations. Also a really great time to recognize new ways to improve the partnership and to address issues that we hadn't addressed before. It is a wonderful opportunity to gather data and to start filling that void in the medical literature and then apply some of the findings that we get to our planning. So hopefully with fast turnaround and then later in six to 12 months after we've all had to go down this new road and pilot new initiatives, we should gather data again. What worked well, what didn't, let's keep filling that data void. Also, we wanted to make the point that in theory, any partnership is going to be very equitable with both sides of the partnership bringing equal energy. But this may be one of those times where the high income country partner needs to shoulder more of the burden, whatever that is, um, you know, looking into ways that we can beef up the technology infrastructure with our partners or doing more of the legwork on, you know, writing protocols and whatnot if our partners are overrun with COVID cases. Whatever it may be, um, it may be a slightly inequitable partnership right now, but that is necessary and an investment for us to move forward. And then the last recommendation is we really should just be using this time to help inform best practices for the future for whatever else comes up with COVID and for anything else that may come up after. Next slide. And that's it. So with that, we'll say thank you very much for inviting us. We hope this was useful. Um, and please be in touch if you would like to participate in the survey or if you would like more information. Thanks. Thank you, Peter and Lisa, for your contributions.
Dr. Jim Conway is a professor of pediatrics, pediatric infectious disease fellowship program director, and director of the Office of Global Health at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health, as well as associate director of the UW-Madison Global Health Institute. He is responsible for coordinating global health educational programs involving health professional students at UW-Madison and oversight of international programs in the UW School of Medicine and Public Health while maintaining a busy clinical practice. I have personally witnessed his phenomenal leadership across campus during this unprecedented time, and I'm grateful for his insights regarding what criteria need to be considered before we can consider safely reopening global health electives. Jim, thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Nikki, and thanks for everyone for joining us. You know, it's been fascinating listening to my colleagues as they've gone through various aspects of this, and I feel honored to be able to try to bring it all together in sort of a more high-level discussion of what we're thinking about as we think about what it is to be safe as we restart our global health electives. Next slide. You know, I start sometimes with a review of sort of where we've been, because although I think that this seems like it's an unprecedented pandemic and an unprecedented time, it certainly is, you know, it's not like we haven't lived through these kinds of issues before. And I think as many people may recall, you know, we've had students in the field in the past in the uh, Nepal earthquake or had to deal with the H1N1 pandemic in 2009 as people were concerned about transmission and the safety of people, people being in the field. You know, every program has dealt with coups and various interruptions in telecommunications. And so I do remind people that, you know, for those of us that cannot remember the past, we're condemned to repeat it. And so part of the message and part of the silver lining in all this is that you know, this is a great reminder to think about all the things that we need to think about on a regular basis to both maintain ethical involvement with our partners, but also to do these things in a safe and, and judicious way. Next. You know, when we're thinking about the safety threats for international programming during and after this pandemic, I think the easy and the most straightforward things to think about are the direct effects of this pandemic. But I think in many ways, what we really need to be focused on is thinking about all of the indirect effects things that may not be directly uh, caused by the actual infection spreading, but maybe secondary outcomes from the disruptions that it's caused at various levels. And that's basically what I'm gonna talk about over the next few minutes. Next slide. So the direct risks of SARS-CoV-2, I think are fairly straightforward. You know, We know that SARS-CoV-2 risk is certainly increased as people travel, whether it's through airplanes or being in, in foreign areas. Uh, transmission upon return is a significant concern, or at least was initially when this infection was primarily in Southeast Asia and in Europe, there was a lot of concern about travelers passing through airports or being in areas where the transmission was unchecked and maybe undetected and maybe being able to reintroduce it into, uh, into areas here in the U.S. You know, the, the direct risk certainly also involved discussion of what this was going to look like going forward. I think we've seen at least some diminution of the transmission here in the United States over the summer months when people were more able to be outside, but we've also seen continuous circulation nonetheless. I think there's also anticipation that if this does act like most other respiratory viruses, we may see a more seasonal pattern going forward, and that's part of the reason that people are particularly concerned going into the fall and winter months about what this might look like. You know, one of the other direct risks, obviously, is related to vaccine development and what that's going to look like as allocation and distribution happens. And once there is sufficient capacity, both here in the U.S. and in our country partners, what's the requirements going to look like for entry into countries or return to our country um, as these things become more widely distributed? And certainly similar to what we see with yellow fever or meningococcal vaccines for some travelers, these are things that are actually required to be able to safely enter in, into some of our partner sites. And then finally, thinking just about the disparities and what we see with urban and rural areas where many of our programs happen, you know, we know that in transmission, at least, in dense areas of urban populations, there's more rapid spread, but that spread seems to be more sustained in rural areas, and that's similar to what we're seeing here in the United States now that the, the pandemic has reached those more rural areas. And obviously, coupled with the risk of transmission and spread is also what the health system capacity and what health system access looks like for travelers who are in areas and may need to seek medical care. So these are the direct risks that go along with this pandemic that we're living through. Now let's move on and think about these indirect risks. Next slide. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, you know, on the direct risks, I think the key questions that international educators are being challenged to think about is whether there's actually continued circulation of transmission within a location and what that looks like with the thought being, at least early in this pandemic, that there would have to be at least two incubation periods without documented transmission to even be considered an area that had started to control the pandemic. We need to look at what the CDC and the U.S. Department of State are sharing as far as travel warnings and travel advisories to see whether it's even acceptable within institutional travel policies to go to those areas. We need to look at whether the destination country has the medical resources and the public health resources. Nikki, can you mute? I'm getting things. Um, the, the, whether the destination country actually has the medical resources and public health resolve that if cases do emerge, that those are quickly identified and do not become a, a major flare up or a hotspot. And then looking at the travel routes that are needed to go to and from places and seeing whether there are not only disease transmission risks, but also delays or, or interruptions in transit based on canceled flights and the capacity to deal with people that may be stuck in transit. And then finally, looking at the restrictions about whether there's a lengthy quarantine needed upon arrival. We certainly know now in many international sites that a one to two week quarantine is required for all arriving travelers before they can even be involved in any kind of activities and what that looks like as far as visa controls and non-resident entry restrictions and whether those are manageable is gonna be really challenging and at this point is an unknown, but certainly we know that U.S. travelers are not welcome to enter into most of these areas. Next slide. Now moving on to these more indirect risks. I think these are the ones that are a little bit more nebulous, but a lot more challenging because this really is the stuff that actually can interrupt and disrupt the sustainability of many of our projects and programs, as well as um, the partnerships that we depend on. And so I'm gonna kind of run through these in a little bit more detail, but the things we're thinking about are what are the social and economic and political and policy impacts that are a result of this pandemic and how different countries have dealt with it. You know, a lot of this will depend on what that pre-pandemic situation was and what the healthcare and political capacity was in the beginning, even to deal with any kinds of outbreaks. But then moving on and thinking about what are the governmental restriction, restrictions, quarantine and testing rules, what are the ongoing social distancing guidelines that are dictating how people live and work? Um, what do those look like even after the pandemic is considered ended or at least under control? And we have to understand that this is gonna affect different countries in different regions in very different ways and on different timelines and potentially is gonna be disproportionate to the direct disease impacts. In other words, there may be countries that have a greater disease burden, but may not actually have changes in their policy or changes in the economics and, and social structure um, as much as other places that may have had less disease, but may have much more profound impact. And I think that you can certainly think about that in relation to how the US and Europe look compared to how many of our less resourced partners uh, may be functioning going forward. Next slide. So let's just go through these kind of key ones um, in a little bit more detail. So when we think about the safety issues and what international educators need to think about, and I think the, the the points that we really want to kind of direct our attention to are what are the social structures and the medical resources looking like and are those safely able to support travelers even in the event of an unforeseen disaster or a crisis? Is there going to be civil disorder because of disturbs, disturbations in the economy? Are there going to be increased crime rates as we've seen in, some, in many areas as the economic malaise deepens people's already existing social desperation? And then do we see terrorist groups or rival militias or internal adversaries starting to look at these as opportunities to either take advantage of the situation or intensify their efforts to uh, eliminate what they may consider to be a corrupt or an inept um, leadership? And you know, one of the things we're hearing more and more about already are anti-foreigner protests and anti-foreigner behaviors in many countries where this is considered now a Western disease that was imported or thrust upon these countries who are already in some disarray and whether there will be resentment against students and learners or even Western faculty uh, and even antagonism and harassment. Next slide. The infrastructure issues I think are also important to think about, not necessarily only in the healthcare system, but just in society in general. You know, when we look at the, the infrastructure in most countries, 
you know, what ha has been the effect on skilled and unskilled labor, and, and how is that being restored in sufficient numbers to support the local infrastructure? We know that in many places, things like transportation have been disrupted because the essential workers in those areas have either been so heavily affected by pandemic uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID um, or have um, cut back on, on availability because of the lack of need as businesses are shuttered and, and, and remain closed in many areas. And thinking about just basic goods and services, what is the shipping, transportation, and availability of, of food and other essentials? I mean, will those need, meet the needs of our travelers who are, are going to be nested in these areas? And then whether there may be actual labor tensions um, and high unemployment, where the presence of students or others within a community may be perceived as actually taking away responsibilities um, from others that may actually have looked at those as gainful employment. And then again, finally, looking at how the host government is ensuring not only the availability of public transport and, and food security, but whether those are actually ensured to be helpful and whether those are safe places for people to, to traverse and, and, and safe to use. Next. And then finally, thinking more broadly, and I think my colleagues have done a phenomenal job of thinking about and talking about the importance of partnerships and maintaining those partnerships. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the things we always have to think about is one step back, which is, you know, will those previous partnerships and institutions remain viable at levels that actually provide confidence and academically or otherwise be able to continue to support these kinds of activities? You know, I think we know that with the disruption in education, there is already financial pressure on U.S. educational institutions um, that have had to cancel in-person classes and have had students defer and the financial struggles already of dealing with that, you can imagine being manifested and amplified at many of our partner sites. Do those partner sites actually have a viable plan to transition to distance learning in the moment if the need again emerges? And certainly in some that is much more capa uh, capable than others based on what their infrastructure looks like. And then will the partners be able to actually isolate exposed students and provide quarantine needs when disease may reemerge? And finally, what is the emergency response, the public health system, the police, the public health agencies that um, maintain safety and security? What do those look like? And what is their duty of care and obligation for foreign travelers? Next slide. So, you know, I think what many of us have had to deal with and think about for many years that, that manage global health interactions and global health collaborations is the fact that, you know, in many of our institutions, our leadership's general and first response to most asks is no. You know, if it's different and if it present, presents any sort of either institutional threat or threat to individuals' health and safety, the answer is always going to be no. You know, I, I'm constantly trying to find silver linings within this whole mess that we're in. And one of the things that I've been so impressed by and one of the things that, you know, all my colleagues in these talks have, have really shared is that this is the group of people that have constantly and successfully been able to overcome that inclination of leadership to say no and have come up with really thoughtful, organized, ethical approaches that have allowed us to continue to move forward and partner with many, many places where we've found great benefit, not only for the partner site, but for our learners and for our institutions here as a whole. And so I think that I just challenge people to continue to think about these things as far in advance as you can as you're starting to think about relaunching, because the ultimate answer that we're looking for is yes, yes, we can do this, and yes, we should be able to do this. And we, yes, we absolutely need to continue to do this, but we need to do it in a thoughtful way that really thinks about those direct threats of the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic and pandemic, as well as more importantly, these indirect threats that are gonna disrupt the sustainability of many of our programs. So I thank you for your attention. I thank you for participating and hopefully we can all continue to find silver linings in the situation that we're in. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy days to join this session, and a huge thank you to the expert panelist team. So that concludes um, our panelist uh, discussion today, and thank you so much for joining us. Just a reminder that we do have all the webinar recordings for this series posted on the AAP YouTube playlist. Um, and then a reminder that you'll also receive a, a link to do related to the CME and MOC Part 2 credit for live participation. Here's another reminder about the next webinar, so please save the date for when border crossings are not possible, how to keep pediatric professionals engaged in global health. 
And this will build on today's webinar, which was directed towards educators and trainees, but will focus on pediatric professionals and other ways to engage in global health during this pandemic. And just to mention, AAP Global Health Team is working on a global health education course, so stay tuned for more information about that and other opportunity. And just want to invite you to join the section on global health if you have not done so already. Thank you again to our excellent panelists and to the AAP staff who have made this webinar possible. Um, have a great day.